Thank you for joining today's update uh, on COVID-19 in North Carolina. As of today, we have 9,568 confirmed cases, 463 people in the hospital, and sadly, 342 deaths. We continue to hold the families of the victims in our thoughts as they try to make sense of all this. We've set out in detail the benchmarks we want our state to hit as we move toward the phases that will help spur the economy while keeping us safe. Positive COVID cases, percentage of positive tests, and numbers of people in the hospital. Those are some of the indicators that show us how we're doing in our fight to slow this disease. I invite you to see this data for yourself at nc.gov backslash COVID-19 and visit the case count dashboard. We're seeing some leveling and I hope to see more. We know what helps push down these numbers, social distancing, careful cleaning, and staying home. If we keep working at these, we'll get to where we need to be. Last week, I told you about the budget proposal that we made to the legislature. Today, the session starts, and they'll work on ways to direct federal dollars to help North Carolina. If done right, we can get more testing, increase health care equipment, assistance to those out of work, and other vital things to help our state. We are enacting our battle plan. Just yesterday, you heard Dr. Cohen talk about the Department of Health and Human Services. They signed a key partnership that advances our efforts to fight COVID-19. The Carolina Community Tracing Collaborative brings two trusted groups in North Carolina that we have a long-standing experience in health care to bring on more contact tracers. Now, contact tracing is critical to our ability to safely ease these restrictions. Think of it like detective work, helping to track down anybody who may have been exposed to a person who tests positive. That's an essential step to containing and isolating those who may carry the disease. The collaborative has already started recruiting for the 250 positions they will need to fill. And time is of the essence. I appreciate their quick work to stand up this partnership. I also want to thank another of our key partners today for all of their work, the North Carolina National Guard. Without missing a beat, these 939 men and women that I've activated have been there when we need them, always ready, as their mission explains. Yesterday, our head of the National Guard, General Todd Hunt, and I had a call with the United States Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper. We were able to thank him for the partnership we have in North Carolina, and particularly for the essential work the National Guard is providing in food supply and logistics. We agreed to continue to work together to keep our military personnel battle ready. One of the National Guard's first tasks is supporting warehouse logistics taking in the supplies when they arrive and quickly getting them turned around and shipped out to our local partners. They've conducted 242 missions, traveling over 45,000 miles to 77 counties, delivering personal protective equipment to hospitals, medical sites, and other facilities, and we know how bad we need it. General Alan Boyette is leading our food supply chain work group, which meets daily. They're ensuring our grocery stores remain stocked and our food supply remains strong. They're also working with our food banks, delivering over 40,000 meals to school nutrition sites. And we have Army and Air Guard medical personnel ready to assist in the event we need to use the Sand Hills Regional Medical Center as an overflow medical facility. These are just some of the examples of the work of our National Guard. I'm proud of them. I'm grateful for them. And I can rest just a little bit easier knowing that they are always ready when we need them. As we enter another week of staying at home, I want to thank North Carolinians everywhere for following the restrictions. 
And I want to remind everyone that we can't let our guard down just yet. We have grabbed hold of the opportunity to save lives in North Carolina. Every single one of us who's changed our daily life, we've done that together through our own actions. We continue to plan for the days ahead when we ease restrictions and work our way back to a new normal. But for now, stick with it. We can do this. I know it's hard, but it is saving lives. As one Charlotte teacher said that she would virtually write in her students' yearbooks, rise up, move on. You can do it. We can do this, North Carolina. With me today is our Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Mandy Cohen, our Emergency Management Director, Mike Sprayberry, our Commissioner of Prisons, Todd Ishi, and Assistant Commissioner of Agriculture, Joe Reardon. Monica McGee and Cameron Larson are our sign language interpreters. And behind the scenes, Jackie and Jasmine Mativier are our Spanish language interpreters. Dr. Cohen, we'll first recognize you. Thank you, sir. This crisis is magnifying cracks that have long existed in our health care system, and we ignore them now at our own risk. That is why I wrote a second letter to HHS Secretary Azar today asking him to support the North Carolina health care providers, the doctors, the nurses, hospitals, and other clinicians who serve the more than 2 million people our state covers with our Medicaid program and the 1 million North Carolinians who don't have health insurance. Almost $100 billion from the first round of the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund has now been allocated, a lot of money. But it was divided up in a way that greatly advantaged health providers who mostly see patients with private and employer-based health insurance or Medicare, those patients over 65, and it disadvantaged those health providers willing to serve the people most in need, those serving Medicaid and the uninsured. The federal government's allocation formula essentially had every patient a provider who is seen, if you see them with private and employer-based insurance, would count twice as much as a Medicaid patient. So think about that twice as much counting for the private employer insurance than Medicaid. That means Medicaid providers will receive substantially less from this relief fund compared to others providing the exact same care to privately insured and Medicare patients. Our safety net providers already operate on the thinnest margins, so they are most at risk of closure due to lost revenue and new costs related to COVID-19. The last thing anyone wants during a public health crisis is fewer providers on the front lines. Our essential providers, there are rural hospitals and other rural providers. There are pediatricians who serve six out of 10 North Carolinian children who are enrolled in Medicaid or Health Choice. There are obstetricians who deliver babies across the state. And there are behavioral health providers. And these ongoing financial strains are exacerbated because North Carolina has not expanded Medicaid. That's the one thing our state could do right now to protect families and put our rural hospitals and provider on strong financial footing. At the federal level, we need to support these critical providers so that many North Carolinians who rely upon them for their health and well-being are protected. There's still time to get this right. Congress just allocated another $75 billion to this provider relief fund, bringing the total to $175 billion. 30% of those funds, $50 billion, should be targeted to our safety net health care providers who disproportionately serve Medicaid and the uninsured. In addition to requesting this money from the CARES Provider Relief Fund be directed to Medicaid and uninsured providers, I've also asked Secretary Azar to, uh, to approve our emergency 1115 Medicaid waiver. Such waivers have been approved in prior disasters, and COVID-19 is certainly a disaster. While it would be more fiscally prudent for the state to just expand Medicaid, 
In its absence, we are asking for the federal government to approve a temporary change to cover prevention, testing, and treatment related to COVID-19, and for the flexibility to create our own provider relief fund to further assist providers in weathering the COVID-19 storm. These actions from the federal government will assist North Carolina in its response to this crisis, and I urge federal action quickly. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, and I know a lot of other uh, Health and Human Service secretaries and governors across the country feel the same way about that, and we'll push it and see what we can get done. We'll now recognize uh, Emergency Management Director Mike Sprayberry. Mike. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for your leadership. Today is day 50 of the COVID-19 response at the State Emergency Operations Center. Under the direction of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, FEMA will begin sending shipments of personal protective equipment to more than 15,000 Medicaid and Medicare certified nursing homes across the nation, including more than 430 in North Carolina. These shipments are intended to supplement the regular supply of personal protective equipment to these facilities. Shipments are expected to begin next week and be completed in mid-June. Each facility will receive an allotment of gloves, gowns, eye protection, and surgical masks based on the size of the facility. We're also continuing our procurement of PPE equipment with another $8.2 million in orders yesterday. So far, the total of supplies and equipment ordered for the COVID-19 response is about $335 million. Among yesterday's items that we received were several shipments of face shields along with face mask and soap. We shipped supplies to 14 locations and we received 40 requests for PPE just yesterday. We've received 45 requests for PPE so far today. This week, the Human Services section here at the State Emergency Operations Center started holding regular counting, county feeding coordinator calls three times per week. These calls are intended to provide feeding strategy support to our local partners to ensure that no one in North Carolina is going hungry. Sharing information and best practices and learning from the experiences of others helps everyone out. Today, the State Emergency Response Team is also working at the Sand Hills Regional Medical Facility on refining our concept of operations and our patient flow planning. While we may not need to operate this facility, it's important that we have a medical surge contingency plan in place in the event that we need space for non-COVID-19 patients. Sand Hills needs to be ramped up and ready to go. We really appreciate our partners in Richmond County and Hamlet, North Carolina, and at First Health for the outstanding support they provided from day one as we've worked to bring the Sand Hills facility to the necessary level of operational readiness. In closing, it's important that we all continue to stay at home and practice social distancing per Governor Cooper's executive order. You, as an individual, have the power to flatten the curve that will enable our state to move ahead with easing restrictions. Always remember to look out for your family, friends, and neighbors, and to call your loved ones daily. With your help, we will get through this together as one team, one mission, and one family. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Director Sprayberry. We'll now take media questions. If you can state your name and the organization that you represent, we would appreciate it. We'll take our first question. Our first question is from Brian Murphy, News Observer and Charlotte Observer. Hi, Governor. Um, two, two questions. Among the criteria for reopening um, is expanding the testing or the number of tests that are being performed in North Carolina. Can you explain what the current bottleneck or roadblock to getting more testing done in North Carolina is? Is it PPE or sample collection, test kits, reagents, uh, the number of people requesting the test? What, what is stopping us from getting to that number? And then secondly, you had mentioned uh, talking with NASCAR last week and the teams. Have you made any decisions about the Coca-Cola 600? 
as to the first question, uh, we believe that we're going to reach our goal in the number of tests that we need for the indicators. Uh, we're getting more and more testing capability every day. We're getting more and more personal protective equipment, uh, getting more testing capacity with our private labs. Uh, yesterday, I was on a conference call with the governors and the president and federal government is going to help us some with testing. I think we realized about a month ago that the states were going to be responsible for getting us where we needed to get, and we realized that and have been working on it uh, since that time. We'll take as much federal help as we can possibly get. Uh, we want to, to get our testing up to the point where we can go in and test at uh, job sites where an employee is tested positive to go in and test everybody. We want to be able to go in and test everybody at a nursing home when there's an a outbreak there. And we want to increase the testing all around. It's one of the reasons why we have put up a testing surge group and why we've also uh, set up this collaboration in order to uh, increase the tracing because the testing is important but we also want to trace people and find out whether they've been in contact with someone who's tested positive to be able to protect people further and allow us to ease restri restrictions. Secretary Cohen, would you want to answer anything? On, on the second part, I have had conversations with NASCAR officials and officials at the Charlotte Motor Speedway, and uh, they have submitted plans that involve social distancing. Our public health officials, Secretary Co Cohen and uh, State Health Director Betsy Tilson, have uh, looked at them and made some suggestions, but uh, will approve those. And we believe that unless health conditions go down, that we can have the Coca-Cola 600 uh, on Memorial Day weekend in Charlotte. I think that, or in Concord is where it would be, I think that NASCAR will be making that announcement, but we believe that's what will happen. Next question, please. Olivia Neely, The Wilson Times. Uh, this is Olivia with the Wilson Times. Just following up with the testing, um, <clears throat> this might be for Dr. Cohen to answer, but the Durham uh, VA team members were out here in Wilson at the state-owned uh, nursing facility here that has an outbreak, and they said that they had tested 180 employees today. Um, is this a part of an ongoing effort? Um, can you explain maybe why they were there? Whenever there is an outbreak or whenever there is a positive, we want to get into the nursing homes or any of these congregate care facilities to provide testing to determine what the extent of the problem is and to then to be able to uh, separate people who have tested positive from those who haven't, have separate staff looking after people who have tested positive than people who haven't. Uh, Dr. Cohen, you may want to talk specifically about that. Sure, that, that was exactly right, Governor. And in this case, um, we have partnered with the, the VA Medical Center. They've been terrific partners um, and are the ones that are helping us surge our testing ability. I think it goes back to the earlier question to say, how can you ramp up testing? It's going to take effort along many, many fronts, not just from getting the right supplies, but also getting the right people in the right place so that we can respond to these kinds of things, like an outbreak at a nursing home. This one happens to be um, us wanting to test at one of our states operated facilities um, and we have partners from the VA who are helping us ramp up our ability to do it. In other places we partner with FQHCs and others it's the hospital system and others it's our um, outpatient providers. So it's a huge team effort um, across North Carolina to make sure we have the appropriate testing. That's exactly the work the governor was describing related to the testing work group is to really get um, that coordination across our state so we can all partner together to make sure the testing gets done for those who need it. Thank you. Next question, please. Tresia Bold, WITN. 
Hi, my question is, as far as when it comes to contact tracing, um, how, <clears throat> excuse me, is that hiring process going and is um, basically with the contact tr tracing, how do we uh, choose these people and how will this kind of supplement what the health department are already doing? Already there are about 250 people across our states at our health department that are already in the trenches doing great work on contact tracing and they've spent a lot of time doing this since this virus has hit North Carolina. This, is, uh, this uh, collaboration is going to add 250 people more and already the word is out that these jobs are open and we're, we're hoping that they can get on the job very soon because time is of the essence and we hope that that process can begin very, very soon, that the additional people can get to work very soon. Would you want to add to that, Dr. Cohen? Sure, thank you. Other than to say that recruiting has already begun, if anyone is interested, they can visit the Community Care of North Carolina site, which is our partner in this uh, uh, contact tracing collaborative. Uh, we've already heard from more than a thousand people who've already submitted interest in it. So we're thankful to our North Carolinians who have already been, uh, who just even in the last 24 hours have already raised their hand to say they wanted to help. Again, we have had said yesterday we're going to be prioritizing folks who have become unemployed because of COVID-19 and do have experience working in the field with communities. Um, so Community Care of North Carolina is going to be working on vetting and then and actually hiring on those folks and then to begin training them and then deploying them out to our local health departments. Thank you. And we get this going well, that's gonna allow us to ease these restrictions because uh, if we get this testing and tracing humming along, which is what we wanna do, then that means we can be better protected as we ease restrictions across the state and go through these phases. Uh, next question, please. Travis Fain, WRAL. Uh, thank you. This is Travis Fain with WRAL. I wondered, the modeling that Novisci and some other entities put out uh, through the state a few weeks ago, has that been updated? And if so, uh, when will we see that new modeling uh, and, and what exactly will it be based on? Uh, one of the things uh, about modeling that, that I think is important is that we can affect what the modeling shows by uh, obeying these restrictions and social distancing and staying home. So that's an important part of showing us what's coming. Another important thing is that the indicators that we have put forth, I think, are, are very specific and those are real numbers on a day-to-day -day basis, like numbers of cases, like percentage of positive cases, like hospitalizations, like pre-COVID symptoms, those kinds of things are solid numbers that we are looking at, and those are the things we're looking at regarding making decisions about going into next phases. But I'll let uh, Dr. Cohen address that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Travis, for the question. And yes, this independent group of modelers um, has been working, again, uh, in coordination with us, but they have been working independently. My understanding is they're going to be um, uh, putting out another um, brief even as of today, possibly this afternoon or first thing tomorrow. Um, and again, just to reiterate where the governor was, uh, that, that modeling is not some of the information that we are using in terms of moving to reopening. It does help us for planning purposes and I think has been helpful as we think about the kinds of things that our hospitals need to do in particular in, in thinking about our surge planning. Luckily, we haven't needed to use those plans, but I think it's been helpful for us to do um, the kinds of surge planning that our, um, our hospitals have been able to do. And, and now um, we are going to keep those plans activated so as we move through these phases, we can make sure that we have the medical capacity we need. Thank you. Thanks, next question, please. Jonathan Drew, Associated Press. Um, hi, this is Jonathan Drew with the Associated Press. Um, Governor Cooper, the reopen NC protesters were out there again today. Um, what's your reaction to their notion that your reopening plan 
isn't moving fast enough. Thank you. I understand that people are eager to ease these restrictions. I know it's frustrating uh, to be at home so much. I also know and have talked to many business owners and people who are out of work. A lot of families are hanging by a thread and this is one of the reasons that we're pushing out unemployment payments and pushing out stimulus money, trying to get money to small businesses because the thing we have to put first and foremost is the public health and safety of North Carolinians. And we have to make sure that things are safe. I'm very eager to move into our phases of reopening. And we have an, a, a way to look at the indicators to tell us how fast that we're gonna get there. And I hope that we move through these as quickly as possible. But we're gonna rely on the science, we're gonna rely on the data, and we're gonna rely on the facts in order to make decisions about moving forward and we're going to involve our business community in helping us make decisions about how we do that so that they can be the most effective while we can also be effective at keeping people safe. Thanks. Uh, next question, please. Elizabeth Ann Brown, Asheville Citizen Times. Um, hello, Governor. I'm Elizabeth Ann Brown from the Asheville Citizen Times newspaper. Um, I am hoping to get some clarity about the uh, deaths that are reported uh, every day. Um, what are the requirements since there have been some persistent rumors on social media that um, these are suspected deaths or not confirmed related to COVID-19? Uh, what is required to, to add a death to that tally? And are y'all considering adding um, the date the deaths occurred to the state tally? for that question and I just want to triple confirm with our team to make sure I, I, I get this right but those deaths are determined by our medical examiners uh, most of them are, are folks who had been found to be COVID-19 positive before their passing um, but let us get back to you with the specifics of how our uh, our deaths are recorded and attributed to COVID-19 versus um, versus not we've got that question a couple of times and I, I don't want to get that wrong for you so we'll, we'll follow back up thank you Thank you. Next question, please. Matt Debnam, Washington Daily News. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Uh, my question for you today is, uh, what are your thoughts on potentially granting local governments additional flexibility to safely ease some restrictions at their own pace? Thank you. Thanks. We know that this virus does not respect county lines. There are people who live in one county work in another county, shop in yet another county. And when that happens, the virus can spread from county to county. We know that there have been some hot spots, for lack of a better word, in our state. And some local governments have wanted to go further than the orders that I put in place on a statewide basis. But we're gonna continue with having the state have a floor with some counties and local some cities being able to have more restrictions than that we'll still leave open the potential of looking at regional reopening if the data shows us that going forward right now we're, we're not there yet uh, hopefully by may 8th we can begin going into phase one if the numbers tell us that we can can do that but we'll continue to look at the potential of regional phases, and we've gotten some input on that from across the state. Thanks. Uh, next question, please. Ginger Livingston, The Daily Reflector. Hi, Governor. This is Ginger Livingston with The Daily Reflector. Well, I would like to get your reaction to Carteret County um, Atlantic Beach making decisions to start opening their beaches to the public before May 8th. I think that uh, local governments do have the authority to do that. And my understanding that some of these local communities are 
opening beaches more than they were but are putting some restrictions in the people who can be on the beach and the kinds of things that they can do. We would encourage these local communities to do things that encourage people to keep moving, encourage people to be socially distant, and we have been on the phone with a lot of our municipalities and our public health people work with theirs and we'll continue to to talk about that but that is something that they can do and some of them have done but they're doing that on a gradual basis thanks next question please kate martin carolina public press Good afternoon, Governor. This is Kate Martin with Carolina Public Press. I'm wondering um, which areas of the state are most in need of contact tracer, tracers. I know some counties are saying that they've got enough for the effort up ahead, but I'm wondering if there's anything like an urban or rural divide and that sort of thing. Thank you. Hi, Kate. It's Mandy Cohen. Thanks for that question. It's, it's a mix. There are certain counties that are our smaller counties but may have a hot spot due to either a nursing home outbreak or other that they're responding to, so it stretches their resource and then they need some extra help. Or in some of our urban centers, there's just more people, more work. So it's, it's a bit of a mix. We have surveyed our, um, our public health uh, leadership and asked them. And the good news is most of them have said they're, they're doing quite well to handle um, what, what the work that there is. But we know that things are going to ramp up because um, as we know, if we loosen things, we may have more spread of the virus. And we want to make sure that we're able to jump on that very quickly, as the governor mentioned. So that's why we're bringing on this new additional workforce that the local health departments can request we can deploy it and then they can work side by side with folks who have been doing the contact tracing in um, in these communities and again it helps us build up that workforce uh, over a period of time thank you thank you next question please this will be our final question Cole Del Charco WUNC Hi, thanks for taking my question. I'd like to direct uh, this question to Director Sprayberry. Um, despite the tallies you keep giving us on PPE numbers that the state continues to get and that we're getting more and more PPE, we still don't have information on who's requesting the PPE and who's getting it from the state. Uh, I wonder if you could share a little bit about that. So the way that it's been working is uh, we get requests from our eight healthcare preparedness coalitions which make up 124, our 124 hospitals. We also get um, requests for PPE from our counties, and it goes two different directions. The ones going from the healthcare preparedness coalitions and the and long-term care facilities come up through our Office of Emergency Medical Services that's uh, co-located with us here at the EOC. And the, the, the request for PPE coming in from the counties um, comes to us right here at emergency management. And so what we do is we have a prioritization list. And of course, we're going to prioritize PPE going out to the more acute patients at the hospitals and the long-term care facilities. But we are also able to provide some PPE to our county partners as we get more and more and the supply lines are loosening up. We've also been receiving information uh, that our private, uh, private uh, sector partners are providing some level of support of PPE to our counties and hospitals as well. So um, it's hard to get oversight of all of that, but we know that that's coming in as well uh, in some, some pretty good quantities. And so uh, between the amount that we're getting um, purchasing and between what the local partners at the hospitals and at the county level are purchasing, um, we're beginning to make somewhat of a dent in our need, but we still have a long way to go. Thank you. Thanks everybody for tuning in today. Please stay safe, stay at home if you can, and uh, we'll see you next time.